no faith, I'm letting go With no trust, I'm holding on This love's the song Your hope and love This love's the song Your hope and love In your hand, I'll face the storms In your will, I'm pressing Daniel chapter uh, 11, looking uh, at um, a, lot of, a lot of details that Daniel gives about future kings and uh, in conflicts. And uh, as we've said before, as we've been going through uh, our study in Daniel, um, uh, the book of Daniel has uh, been under uh, attack by liberal scholars for uh, a number of years. In the third century, there was a very well-known philosopher that came out basically uh, and said there's no way that uh, Daniel could have written this in the 6th century B.C. Uh, because primarily of, of some of the details he gives uh, in chapter 11 that we're about ready to go through. Uh, it is so detailed. We're going to go through uh, 20 verses from verse, well, actually 19, verse 2 to 20. Uh, and actually we'll enumerate 40 plus details that uh, Daniel predicts that would happen uh, in, in the future in a particular sequence. It's... Uh, uh, and of course, we know that uh, they did uh, uh, happen. Uh, and so, again, the, the liberal scholars uh, from the third century on uh, said there's no way that, uh, that Daniel could write this. Of course, they deny a belief in God or that God could speak to a man and, and tell him the future in advance, which is what uh, God does through, through prophecy. Uh, Isaiah 46, 9 says, I am God and there's no other. I am God and there's none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. So again, uh, Isaiah, of course, and uh, his prophecy, his predictions of future events, and uh, Daniel here in terms of uh, uh, world events. Uh, Jerome, one of the early church leaders, in answer to that particular philosopher, wrote a, a thousand-page commentary just on the book of Daniel to try to uh, give an answer to, uh, to those critics. And um, and basically, the, uh, the discussion and the debate went on for a number of years until 1947 and the discovery of the, of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And we'll make mention of that again, but just uh, again, if you're not familiar, in 1947, um, a Bedouin is, is uh, searching for his sheep. He goes into a cave, finds some clay pots, and, and unearths what's been considered the greatest archaeological discovery of the, uh, of the 20th century. Uh, we were in China just uh, you know, a few weeks ago, and we were able to go to the terracotta soldiers there, which of course the Chinese say is the greatest archaeological discovery in the 20th century. And it is uh, amazing uh, because through those things, looking at the, the horses and the soldiers and so forth, you can s learn so much about a culture. Uh, but the greatest discovery is a, a manuscript discovery because then you have their thoughts, not just what they look like and their utensils and trying to guesswork, but you, you actually have manuscripts are the greatest archaeological discoveries. Uh, in those manuscripts, there was uh, every book of the Bible of the Old Testament except the book of Esther. Uh, you can line up the scroll of Isaiah uh, and, uh, and take a Hebrew Bible today and they match letter for letter. The only thing that's any different is uh, in 900 AD in the Masoretic text, they started adding accents so they could, you know, distinguish or how to pronounce words. You know, we've, we've only recently started doing that in, in Hawaiian. Suddenly, Miley became Maili. I don't know how that happened, but uh, it did. I think it was an advertising thing. But uh, what do you call the surf spot? We still call it Miley. But, uh, uh, you know, add the accent, it changes. Uh, they added that. Other than that, uh, it, letter for letter, it's perfect. So the Dead Sea Scrolls tell us the accuracy uh, of God's word. Because uh, you, you hear that all the time in universities and so forth and religious classes. Well, it's been copied so many times, it can't possibly be accurate. No, it's accurate letter for letter. But the other thing it did that pertains to our study in the book of Daniel is that uh, because now we had not the original, but a copy of Daniel's manuscript uh, that we're able to date at least, at least older than 200 BC. As we go through these events, I'll mention <laughs> some of the dates as we go through them. Uh, and, and the bottom line is that, is that uh, as, as these events are happening that Daniel predict, 
sitting in a clay jar in a cave uh, in, near En Gedi uh, uh, is the manuscript of Daniel, already there, already intact before the events uh, unfold. And, um, and, and no longer did liberal critics really want to debate much the issue of the accuracy of, uh, of Daniel. But uh, really uh, an amazing text and uh, so detailed that uh, we're going to really take it in, uh, in three weeks. We're going to go through uh, the issue of the Persian kings that are, that are announced, the Greek kings, and in particular kings of the north and the south that are the Seleucid Empire and the Ptolemy Empire. And Daniel focuses on those because they have to do with Israel, Israel's existence, Israel's persecution, what will happen to Israel uh, in the future. Next week, we'll take the next section that deals with Antiochus Epiphany in particular, who we've already discussed. Uh, Daniel's already made reference from, uh, of him, the stern-faced king that comes on, uh, who is really a type of the Antichrist. And then from verse um, 36 on, uh, we shift in time period, because verse 35 begins to talk about a king in the last days. And so from verse 36 on, we're really talking about... Uh, prophecy yet to be fulfilled in terms of the Antichrist. So again, two kinds of prophecies in the Bible, those that are fulfilled, those that are yet to be fulfilled. The ones that we're looking at this morning and next week have already been fulfilled. In two weeks, we'll look at the ones that are yet to be fulfilled. We're kind of, um, it, it's a lot of information and uh, I'm going to kind of, I tried to lay it out as, um, as simply as I could and as cleanly as I could so we could kind of march through it and you can see some of the details, and of course, it's my hope and prayer that if anything else, you just go, wow, wow, that's incredible. God's word is incredible that, uh, that it's so accurate and that we can trust it. You know, as uh, Peter says, it says, forget the spiritual experiences. We have the more sure word of prophecy. That's how we can know the Bible is true. Uh, Daniel's got a purpose or God's got a purpose in revealing this to Daniel that he might, uh, again, lay this out to Israel, to the Jews, because they're getting ready to go through some horrific experiences. And he wanted them to cling to his word, even as he would uh, us. We'll, come, we'll kind of march through it, and then we'll come back, and, uh, and then I'll pretty quickly, actually, in, and uh, we'll, we'll go through uh, about 300 years of ancient history in about 20 minutes here. And then we'll, we'll come back. Don't start set your watches by that, of course. And we'll come back at the end, and... Uh, and try to uh, talk more about, again, why, why God gave this to Daniel. And then we'll make some distinctions uh, between his prophecies versus the prophecy in the book of Revelation given to John and, and how that might uh, help apply some of this to our own lives. All right, we begin in verse 2 as we left off last week. And the first thing we would say is that Daniel gives us details about four Persian kings. Verse 2, now then I tell you the truth, three more kings will appear in Persia and then a fourth who will be far richer than all the others. When he has gained power by his wealth, he will stir up everyone against the king of Greece. So very simply, Daniel predicts four specific details about the Persian kingdom. There's going to be four. The fourth king will be far richer. He'll gain power by his wealth. He will stir up everyone against the king of Greece. And, uh, and now as uh, we look, uh, was... Daniel's uh, predictions correct? Uh, well, there were four Persians, King Cyrus, who was ruling at the time of Daniel. He's followed by uh, Cambius, and then Pseudomeridus, and then Darius Histopes, and then Xerxes. Those are the four Persian kings, as Daniel said there would be. He said the fourth king would be far richer, and he was. Xerxes was far richer than, uh, than any of the other kings. Uh, we are familiar with him as the husband of Esther. Uh, this is the book of Esther. This is the king that uh, has the beauty contest. Esther wins and, and becomes his new wife. Uh, third Daniel said that he would gain power by his wealth. And, um, and that exactly what, that's what he did. With his money, he was able to build up his, uh, his army, upwards of a million men. Again, the way the Medo-Persians or the Persians uh, entered into conflict, uh, they weren't the strategizers and so forth. Uh, as, uh, as the Greeks were, as the Romans were later. Uh, they, were, they just tried to outnumber <laughs> the other guys and just brute force. That's, that's how they would uh, win their battles. So he builds up an army uh, of, of a million men plus. And then Daniel said he'd go to war against the king of Greece. Uh, and of course, uh, and that's exactly what he does in 480 BC. 
Uh, and we talked about that a little bit when Daniel was laying out all the world empires and how they would come into being. Uh, Xerxes uh, moves with his million uh, man army, you know, again, across uh, modern day uh, Iraq and, and uh, Syria and so forth, gets to the Mediterranean, sets out with his navy uh, across to conquer Greece. They are caught in a storm and uh, the ships are damaged, many lives are lost and so forth. So they arrive on the beach to engage in battle with um, uh, much less the numbers than they had uh, anticipated uh, and they are, they are turned back in defeat. Xerxes returns and uh, in his depression throws a big banquet. As you know, the story of Esther then enters. He orders his wife Vashti to come and dance before him. She refuses. She's banished. And then the, his counselors uh, encourage him to have uh, a beauty contest and find a new queen. And that's how Esther becomes the queen. That's the historic period that we're talking about again, about 480 BC when he sets out on that expedition against Greece. So, so far... Daniel's bad in a thousand. Two, Daniel gives us details about a mighty king and great power. We see that in verses three to four. Then a mighty king will appear who will rule with great power and do as he pleases. After he has appeared, his empire will be broken up and parceled out towards the four winds of heaven. It will not go to his descendants, nor will it have the power he exercised, because his empire will be uprooted and given to others. So again, there's... Here in those couple of verses, five very specific things about this first great king. He'll rule with great power, do as he pleases. His empire will not go to his descendants. His empire will be uprooted and given to others. The new empire will not have the same kind of power. And his empire will be divided into four kingdoms. And we ask the question, of course, did that happen historically? Was Daniel uh, correct in his predictions? And, and certainly it was. That king, of course, is Alexander the Great. He did rule, one, with great power and did as he, as he pleased. Alexander begins his career of conquering about 334 uh, B.C. He conquers of the Medo-Persian Empire 120 provinces in, in, in three years. And, uh, and if you studied uh, even a little bit about Alexander, hey, there he is, a little glass mosaic. There's lots of artwork depicting uh, Alexander. But uh, he's a guy that, uh, again, in his 30s, uh, uh, ended his life basically as a drunk because there was no more worlds for him to conquer. He did it so rapidly. By the time he reached Western India and was conquering there, his generals are going, I think we're done. You know, I mean, they, they ruled basically from Southern Europe, you know, through Greece, you know, all the way through the Middle East, all the way to India. And uh, they'd been on the road for a while. That was a long deployment. And uh, they decided that they were done. They didn't want to go on conquering any more lands. And um, basically, uh, Alexander gets drunk, uh, stays out in the, the wet and the cold too long, and dies of, of pneumonia. So there was a mighty king that uh, did as he pleased, as Daniel said. And two, his empire did not go to his descendants. And, and that leads into three, his empire was uprooted and given to others. And if you know a little bit about history, you know that his four generals then uh, went junk in a po and decided who got what. No, that's not exactly how it happened. They were uprooted. They fought it out to determine who would rule what. And um, that leads us to four. The new empire did not have the same kind of power. No, because it was split among these four generals. And then the fifth thing, Daniel said his empire would be divided into four kingdoms. And it was. Cassander was over Macedonia and Greece. Uh, Lysimachus was over Asia Minor. Seleucus was over Syria, Turkey, and part of Iraq. Uh, so that he, Seleucus, his Seleucid Empire becomes the king of the north of chapter 11 that we'll look at in a moment. Uh, his general Ptolemy took over Egypt, Israel, and the island of Cyprus. So in our text, he becomes the king of the south as we uh, kind of progress along. So uh, two empires that are focused on from here on out because Israel lies in between. Israel gets caught between the, the, the wars, the intrigue, the struggles, the alliances that go back and forth for the next couple of hundred years. Three, Daniel gives us details about the king of the south and his plans for an alliance. We see that in verse five and six. The king of the south will become strong, but one of his commanders will become even stronger then he and will rule his own kingdom with great power. After some years, they will become allies. 
the daughter of the king of the south will go to the king of the north to make an alliance, but she will not retain her power, and he and his power will not last. In those days, she will be handed over together with the royal escort and her father and the one who supported her. Get a few more details here. We'd say there's four more specific details about the king of the south. And uh, we'll, it's going to start to sound like a soap opera in a minute. But let's enumerate them. The king of the south will become strong, Daniel says. One of his commanders will become even stronger. The daughter of the king of the south will be given for an alliance. They will not retain their power and be handed over. So again, was Daniel correct in his predictions? Well, the king of the south who became strong was Ptolemy Lagos, Lag, Lagidi, or also Soter, S-O-T-E-R. Look it up on... Wikipedia, and you can uh, read all about these guys if you want to later. And uh, didn't know if we had a picture of him or not. But uh, anyway, he's the king of the south. Um, one of his commanders did become even uh, stronger, began to rule his, uh, his own kingdom and so forth. But at a point in time, they did become allies, just the way Daniel predicted. The daughter of the king of the south is given for an alliance. This is uh, a little... A bit later, and this is Ptolemy Philadelphus, the king of the south, who gave his daughter Bernice to be married to Antiochus II, the king of the north. There they are. So uh, there he is with his daughter Bernice right behind him. The king of the north, again at this point, is Antiochus II. And um, this gets a little interesting because uh, he is married to a gal named Laodicea. He now, in order to help form this alliance, these guys have been fighting it out for a while, so maybe this would be a good thing. And typical in that day, he would receive his daughter, marry her, and they would form this alliance together. And, uh, and so to do that, he's got to take his wife. Uh, Sorry, honey, you're not my wife anymore. Can you just kind of stay over here for a while? And then he marries uh, uh, Bernice, and, and she comes into to the whole thing. Don't forget Laodicea. She comes back into the picture here in a moment. Because Daniel says, for they did not retain their power and they were handed over. Well, in two years, Ptolemy uh, Philadelphus dies, king in the south. Uh, and when he does, the king of the north, Antiochus II, this married Bernice, is going, well, <laughs> there goes that alliance. I mean, he, he, he forms this with this guy down there so they'll have alliance. Two years later, he dies. So he tells Bernice, we're done. And then he kind of, in a sense, remarries Laodicea. So now she's back in the driver's seat. So she kills Bernice <laughs> just to make sure there's no competition in the, in the future. Uh, well, again, that's what Daniel said would happen. The daughter would be given an alliance, but it wouldn't work. They would not retain their power. They would be uh, handed over. So again, exactly what Daniel said did happen. Four, Daniel gives us details about a descendant of the king of the south. And this is uh, be a descendant of Bernice in verses 7 to 8. One of her family line will arise to take her place. He will attack the forces of the king of the north and enter his fortress. He will fight against them and be victorious. He will also seize their gods, their metal images, their valuable articles of silver and gold and carry them off to Egypt. For some years, he will leave the king of the north alone. So here, Daniel predicts five specific details about the descendant of the king of the north. Uh, one, he's from her family line, will rise to take her place. Two, he'll attack the king of the north, enter his fortress. Three, he'll fight against them and be victorious. Four, he'll seize their gods, their metal images, their ver valuable articles of silver and gold, carry them back to Egypt. He will leave the king of the north alone for some time. And again, Daniel was obviously correct in his predictions. One of her family uh, line did arise. His name was Ptolemy Eurogetes. Uh, and he basically is her brother. So he's a root of the branch. He's her brother. So Daniel um, is correct there. And he did, in fact, attack the king of the north. He came against the Seleucids, conquered the northern kingdom. And then he ends up, remember Laodicea that came back and she murdered Bernice? But this guy is Bernice's brother. So when he conquers the north, he kills Laodicea. Hope you're keeping up with all these details. Uh, three, Daniel said he would be victorious. He was. And he gave some other details. And four, he did seize their gods, their metal images, 
and carries it all back to Egypt. Now, Jerome tells us that he took back 40,000 talents of silver, 2,500 idols as he uh, sacked the treasury and takes it all back to Egypt. And fifth, he left the king of the, of the north alone for a, a time. Uh, again, Daniel said he's going to be successful. All this is going to happen. But then he just gets going to kind of pull back instead of kind of conquering him uh, uh, completely. And that's exactly what he, what he did. Five, Daniel predicts the king of the north will invade the south. And we see that in verses 9 and 10. Then, then the king of the north will invade the realm of the king of the south, but will retreat to his own country. His sons will prepare for war and assemble a great army, which will sweep on like an irresistible flood and carry the battle as far as his fortress. So here Daniel predicts uh, four specific details of the king in the north. He'll retreat to his own country. His sons will prepare for war. His sons will assemble a great army. His sons will sweep down like a flood. They'll carry the battle as far as the fortress. And, um, and certainly these things did, did happen. When the king in the north did retreat to his own country, this is King uh, Callinicus, who was able to mount an attack against Egypt in about 240 BC. Now, I mentioned the 240 BC because probably by then, everything that Daniel's written is on a scroll in a clay jar in a cave near Engedi, sitting there <laughs> by now. Everything else that happens after this, uh, we know the scroll was already there by then. And, and obviously, we believe that uh, uh, Daniel wrote it in the 6th century, uh, to also verify that Jesus refers to Daniel as a prophet. That's a pretty good verification. Um, so let's look at these. Again, the king of the north retreats. Uh, his sons did then prepare for war. His two sons, Seranus and Antiochus the Great. Antiochus, Seranus gets kind of killed in battle, but uh, uh, Antiochus the Great is uh, on the scene for a while. His sons did assemble a great army. They've got about uh, 70,000 foot soldiers, history tells us. They did sweep down like a flood. They carried the, uh, the battle as far as a fortress. They didn't make it all the way to Egypt, but they made it down the Gaza Strip, which uh, Hamas is <laughs> ruling today. But that strip of desert on the Mediterranean that leads down to Egypt, uh, they had a, uh, the Egyptians had a fortress there, uh, and that's how far they, they made it. And... Um, uh, and again, at that point in time, the king of Egypt decided it was a little too close for comfort. He marches out with his 70,000 plus, and there's kind of a standoff at that point, kind of the bottom edge of the Gaza Strip, as Daniel said would happen. Six, see, we're moving right along. There's only eight. Daniel predicts the king of the south will march out in rage. We see that in verse 11. Then the king of the south will march out in a rage and fight against the king of the north, who will raise a large army. But it will be defeated. When the army is carried off, the king of the south will be filled with pride and slaughter many thousands. Yet he will not remain triumphant. Daniel predicts four more details about the two kings. King of the north will have a large army. King of the north will be defeated. The king of the south will be filled with pride and slaughter many thousands. The king of the south will not remain triumphant. And, and obviously, how many think that all these things happen? The king of the north had a large army, as we mentioned, 70,000 strong, but we also know from history uh, that he was defeated. The king of the south in Egypt, Ptolemy Pelopater, kind of like Pitter-Patter, but Philopater, uh, raises an army of, of 70,000 uh, plus. Some say historical documents say 73,000. Other details, though, 5,000 cavalry and 73 elephants uh, that he uses in battles. Kind of sounds like the Lord of the Rings. Uh, and he goes out and he is able to defeat Antiochus the Great. Now what? He's not captured though. He flees into the desert. He gets away uh, and heads back again. Then next, Daniel says, that having happened, Ptolemy Pitter-Patter, Philopatter, um, uh, is filled with pride. And did he slaughter many thousands? Yes, he did. He, uh, he killed at least 10,000 of the troops of Antiochus's. He, he uh, destroyed three of the cavalry units and five of the elephants and took 4,000 prisoners. But four, the king of the south did not remain triumphant. Didn't press the victory either. I mean, they could have gone after Antiochus the Great, ended it all right there, but they just let him go. They retreat. They don't continue in, in the march up towards uh, uh, modern-day 
Syria. They, they let them go. So he did not remain triumphant, even as Daniel said. Seven, Daniel predicts the king of the north will muster another army. Verses 13 to 16. For the king of the north will muster another uh, army, larger than the first. After several years, he will advance with a huge army, fully equipped. In those times, many will rise against the king of the south. The violent men among your own people will rebel in fulfillment of the vision, but without success. Think of the king of the north will come and build up siege ramps and will capture a fortified city. The forces of the south will be powerless to resist. Even their best troops will not have the strength to stand. The invader will do as he pleases. No one will be able to stand against him. He will establish himself in the beautiful land. And of course, that's Israel. You thought it was the windward side of Oahu, but beautiful land usually is a reference to Israel in the Bible. Uh, in the beautiful land, and will have the power to destroy it. So there are seven more details given in regards to the king of the north. Hang in here. We're going to get to the end of these 40 details in a moment. Talk about them a bit. One, he'll bring an army larger than the previous one. He'll wait several years, and then he will advance uh, against this large fully equipped army, or with this fully equipped army. He will be joined by others who will arise against the king of the south. Violent people of the south will rebel. He will come and build up siege ramps. He will do as he pleases, and no one will be able to stand against him. He will establish himself in the beautiful land, uh, or Israel, and he'll have the power to destroy uh, Israel. Again, how did these things come about? Well, um, he brought a, one, he brought an army larger than the previous. And this is still Antiochus the Great. He's able to escape through the desert from that last battle. He goes back up uh, and he takes 14 years to raise a lot of money uh, in a huge army. And then he's about ready to go to battle. But he's waiting and he's biding his time. Uh, two, it says he would wait several years and then advance with a large fully equipped army. Remember, Ptolemy in the south, pitter-patter, fellow patter he dies. His son takes over. So Antiochus the Great figures this is a good time to go to war. Why? Because the new Ptolemy that's down there, his name is Ptolemy um, Epiphanes. He's only five years old. <laughs> so he's the new king. He's the new pharaoh. And so he figures this is a good time to, uh, uh, to take this uh, kid on. So then he does uh, march down. Three, he was joined by others who did arise against the king of the south and um, the violent men of the south that would rebel and so forth. There were Egyptian. Once this battle was engaged, once they saw Antiochus coming with this huge, fully equipped army against them, uh, there was a lot of them that did not like the rule of the five-year-old kid. And so they jump in with Antiochus and they rebel. There's Egyptians fighting with the Greeks in this battle. Not only that, other nations jump in, including Jews. Jews from Israel, I mean, they're, they're in the middle. It's like, who's going to treat us better, you know? And it's like, this guy's marching through with this huge army. think he's going to win. We probably better fight with him. So they do, uh, and, and they jump in as well. Again, as Daniel predicted, did he build up siege ramps? Uh, yes, he did. Did he capture a fortified city? Uh, yes, he did. And five it says he uh, did as he pleased, and no one was able to stand against him. Uh, a general Scopus came out, Egyptian general came out to, to meet him, and basically he's destroyed, uh, as verse 15 said would happen. And then six, uh, he would establish himself in Israel. After he conquers Egypt, uh, then he goes back up and stays in Jerusalem for a time uh, and, and, and takes over, quote, uh, the beautiful land. But He's favorable to the Jews because they joined him in the battle. So he could have destroyed it and taken it over, but he does not and eventually heads back up to, uh, to Syria. So Antiochus the Great now is, is controlling the, the whole thing, Egypt all the way up to Syria. Eighth, our final point. Somebody say amen. Daniel predicts the king of the north will come and make an alliance with the king of the south. This gets a little more soap opera-like here. Uh, verses 17 to 20. He will determine to come with the might of his entire kingdom, make an alliance with the king of the south. And he will give him a daughter in marriage in order to overthrow the kingdom. But his plans will not succeed or help him. Then he will turn his attention to the coastlands and will take many of them. But a commander will put an end to his insolence and will turn his insolence back on him. 
After this, he will turn back towards the fortress, fortresses of his own country, but will stumble and fall to be seen no more. His successor will send out a tax collector to maintain the royal splendor. In a few years, however, he will be destroyed, yet not in anger or in battle. So our last seven predictions by Daniel, details of the king of the north. He will come with the might of his entire kingdom and make an alliance with the king of the south. He will give his daughter in marriage. He will turn his attention to the coastlands. He will have a commander who will put an end to his insolence. He will turn back towards his fortresses of his own country, but will stumble and fall to be seen no more. His successor will send out a tax collector to maintain the royal splendor. In a few years, he'll be destroyed. It won't be in anger or in, in battle. And, um, of course, we'd say Daniel was correct in his predictions. Uh, the first one... He did come with the might of his entire kingdom to make alliance with the king of the south. Now, again, time marches on a little bit. He doesn't want to have to worry about the pharaohs amassing another army, coming back in retaliation. So he marches down with his whole entourage and makes an alliance with them. Two, then, to solidify this whole thing, he gives his daughter in marriage. Anybody recognize her just right off in? That's Cleopatra. Aren't you disappointed? <laughs> Doesn't look a thing like Elizabeth Taylor. I don't know if you ever saw the old movie, but um, I don't know if Mark Anthony looked much like Richard Burton either. But uh, nonetheless, that's, this is the daughter given in marriage. Uh, it's Cleopatra. So she's Greek. She's from the area of present-day Syria. She's given to the, the present-day Pharaoh. Uh, the reason he gave her was for intrigue. I mean, he wants someone on the inside. He wants her to um, possibly come to power and solidify his kingdom and his glory and so forth, Antiochus the Great. Um, Daniel says that's not going to happen, and it, it didn't happen. She ended up getting down there herself and thinking, I think I could work this to my own advantage. You know, it's, uh, so the guy she's married to, the pharaoh, uh, it's a pretty large kingdom, she's thinking, so if I play my cards right, I can take this whole thing over, which which she does. And she becomes the last pharaoh. Interesting. A Greek woman becomes the last pharaoh uh, of, of Egypt. Uh, she has no children by him, and, uh, but she does end up realizing that uh, the next rising power in the world is Rome. And um, they're starting to get through, through the shipping lanes that are little envoys down there and so forth. And she realizes that uh, things are waning a bit for her dad up here in the Greek empire, he's soon going to have to deal with the Romans uh, himself. So what she does is she agrees to marry the Caesar or become one of his wives or something. Anyway, they have a kid together. And, um, but she meets a guy named Mark Anthony in the process. And then somehow the Caesar dies. And, uh, and she ends up, I don't know if you can call it a marriage, but she ends up having more kids with uh, Mark Anthony. They have twins. They have another... Uh, another child after that. So she has four kids uh, uh, all together. Again, she's the last pharaoh of ancient Egypt. And um, uh, again, her son, uh, Caesarean, only ruled by, by name only and before Augustus has him uh, uh, executed. The, uh, in terms of, uh, so all of that happened uh, the way Daniel said it was. The third thing, in terms of Antiochus, that wouldn't play out, but he would turn his attention to the coastlands there, the Mediterranean, which he did uh, for. He'd have a commander who put an end to his insolence, and, uh, uh, and he did. Uh, he, he's making his way north along the Mediterranean in some of those islands, and he runs into a Roman general in 190 B.C. named Lucius uh, Scipio. And uh, basically, he persuades him that that's not a good idea to come any closer to Rome than he already is. Uh, and he turns back, as uh, Daniel said he would, he would turn back towards his own fortresses. There he would stumble and be seen no more. He ends up uh, uh, plundering the temple of Belius and Eliamus. And when he, when he does, he's, he's killed and he is seen no more. The sixth thing that Daniel says his successor will send out a tax collector to maintain the royal splendor. His son, Seleucius, and then he gets the same name, Philip Hatter. <laughs> We've already seen uh, one of those before. Uh, but again, now he's under heavy, heavy burden of, of, the, of the Romans. He's got to deliver a lot of tax money. 
Uh, so he's taxing the people tremendously. He sends his prime minister, a guy named Heliodorus, down to Jerusalem because they're still controlling Israel and has them basically raid the temple treasury in Jerusalem to pay, uh, to pay the taxes. So what Daniel said did come true. Uh, it says also then seven in a few years he'll be destroyed, but not in anger or in battle. And in fact, when his primary, prime minister returns, Heliodorus, it is believed that he poisons him in order to uh, gain power <coughs> in the waning days of that kingdom. So he's destroyed neither in anger nor in battle. Lots of details, huh? It's, 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 uh, it's amazing. I mean, it's just amazing. Again, when, uh, you know, you can see why liberal critics hate the book of Daniel. And they really hate chapter 11 because it shows that God exists and that he knows the end from the beginning and that he can speak to a person and tell him the future in advance. And that's why we say and believe that all scripture is God breathed and is useful for, for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work because we can believe it. Uh, because it's true beyond a shadow of a doubt. You know, there was arguments over it for a long time. Praise God for the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, and not only do we see the accuracy letter by letter uh, of God's word, but we find that the predictions of Daniel were sitting there in a clay jar while the events are being played out. And it uh, readily silenced the critics. If you hear anything about the Dead Sea Scrolls these days, you won't hear, I'll just tell you, you won't hear anything about the actual biblical text. The only thing that people will talk today in the press is about other writings they were found there by the, by the community that lived in, in the, out in Quram. And they, they uh, for a long time, were believed to be Essenes. And really, that's kind of up for grabs now. But uh, their writings were out there. So uh, in the press or anything, when they talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls, they'll want to talk about those other writings and things they found. They don't want to talk about the Bible. <laughs> and they don't want to talk about its accuracy. And they certainly don't want to mention that the scroll of, of Daniel was, was there. Now, what Daniel does next then, and then we'll look at next week, is... Uh, he goes into the next um, verse uh, 25 to 35, basically. Uh, and he, he begins to talk about the, the, the next Greek king, the last Greek king, Antigua's Epiphany. And as you know from our other study, this guy is the guy that basically goes into and tries to make a, a <laughs> one more attempt at uh, attacking uh, Egypt. Uh, he fails, and in his frustration, he comes back and destroys Israel, uh, destroys uh, everything in the temple, uh, and then does his best to bring Greek culture to the hearts and the minds of the Jewish people to convert them over. He does this by, by uh, uh, setting up an uh, uh, idol to Zeus, an altar there, sacrifices pigs on the altar in the Holy of Holies uh, there in, in the temple. Some people sometimes say, well, what about the Shekinah glory of God and God's presence? That hadn't been there in a long time. What about the Ark of the Covenant? It hasn't been there since before the Babylonian captivity. Uh, and so he basically desecrates the temple and he's there until the, the Maccabees, and we'll talk about them more next week, eventually are able to, uh, to drive th them out. Uh, the, Greek, the Greek thought was so permanent, um, permeating the, the Jewish culture at that point, uh, there was a group uh, of men that decided, listen, we got to do what we can to kind of get back to the Bible here and not be influenced by this liberal thinking. And so they formed a sect of Judaism to kind of protect the scripture, try to live a righteous life. And uh, we call them Pharisees. <laughs> They're around at the time of Jesus, but they started out as the good guys, by the way, a back to the Bible movement as a result of Antigua's uh, epiphany. Um, again, what, uh, what Daniel was trying to do, as I mentioned at the beginning, is God is speaking to him, telling them what's going to happen in the future because there's going to be horrific things that happen to the Jewish people. And, uh, and if they can know that God is still sovereign, that God is still in control, that we can still trust God. God knew these things were going to happen. And if he's allowing them to happen, there must be for a purpose. But we can trust his word and we can hang on to his word. Because Daniel the prophet told us these things in advance. We
I'll go to the Psalms, what David says and his, his uh, difficult experiences, and we can take comfort in them and so forth. Because we would say, uh, God is still large and in charge despite what's going on in the circumstances of our lives. That's, I think, the purpose of why God allows Daniel to lay uh, all of this out. Now, so having said that, stay with me. I'm going to kind of take us on a little, a little trail, and I'm going to get to something uh, in a moment that I think will kind of click. You can understand why the Jews living during that period, we, they know Daniel's, Daniel's prophecy. Uh, they realize that they're living through this horrific time, and they absolutely believe that this is the fulfillment of what Daniel was saying. Well, <clears throat> they believe, so they believe that all of chapter 11 is completely fulfilled. And, and Jews, uh, after that period of time, Jews at the time of, of Jesus, uh, they believe that chapter 11 is already completely fulfilled. Uh, Jews living today will tell you that chapter 11 is already fulfilled. But uh, actually, in verse 36 to the end of the chapter is still yet future. He begins to talk about another king at the end times or the last days. Uh, and we know that that king is still yet future because Paul says so when he's writing the church at, uh, at Thessalonica. And um, let, let me just read that to you a little bit. Uh, and I'm going to read uh, the 12 verses there. And I've got them for you on the screen. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 12. Again, Daniel is writing so that people can be comforted by God's word, that God is sovereign, and they're going to be able to make it through this thing. Paul is writing to make sure that the people living in his day were not confused over the issue of Daniel 11, that not all of Daniel 11 is fulfilled. A portion of it is, but there's one more stern-faced king, Daniel calls him, that is yet to come. He's still future. We call him the Antichrist. Antiochus Epiphany is a type, but there's still the real guy that is yet future. And so Paul writes this. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy report or letter supposed to have come from us saying the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God, as Daniel said he would. Again, Paul, the, the apostle, studied at the feet of Gamaliel, he knows Daniel's prophecies backward and forward. He also is a Greek scholar. He knows exactly who Antiochus Epiphany is and everything that happens. He knows why, who the Pharisees are and why they form because he is a Pharisee and the son of a Pharisee. Uh, and, he's, and he's writing this to say, don't get confused over this issue to think that all of Daniel chapter 11 has been fulfilled. It hasn't. He says in verse 5, Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things, and now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one, will, lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie, and so that all, all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in, in wickedness. So Paul's saying, don't, don't believe that all of chapter 11 has been fulfilled. There's a man of lawlessness who's still yet to come. Uh, and, uh, uh, and again, Jews in our day, you now understand, they are not looking or concerned about an antichrist or the son of perdition or the lawless one who Daniel spoke about, who Paul talked about. They're not really worried about him coming on the scene because they think he already came on the scene and he was Antiochus Epiphany. So Jews today are not looking or concerned about being deceived and having a new temple built and that if they get a new temple built, the guy that, <laughs> that gets it done 
in, in three and a half years is going to walk in there and declare himself to be God. They're not concerned about that because they think he's already come. They're only looking for a Messiah, a Messiah who will be a political and a military leader that will bring them peace in the Middle East. They are prime and ready for the Antichrist to come on the scene and deceive them because they did not understand the scriptures and did not understand chapter 11 of Daniel's. Neither did much of the early church because of the debate that went on. And even when the church was, quote, reformed in the 1500s, the reformed church still kept to that Jewish theology that what became Roman Catholic theology, which became Reformed theology. So Reformed churches today, which make up in numbers anyway, of people call themselves Christians, about 75% of the Christians in the world today, think that Daniel chapter 11 is completely fulfilled and that it's already happened. But again, Daniel was writing, concerned for the people of Israel, for the Jews to trust and trust God's word. Paul is writing so that we won't be deceived and think that it's all been fulfilled already. Now again, when Daniel finishes his prophecy, the messenger says to him, seal up these words because they're for the future, a time yet to come. Now when John, the apostle John, writes about these things also in Revelation 22, it says, then he told me, do not seal up the words of prophecy of this book because the time is, is near. Daniel talked about it. it would, some of these things would be future, far in advance, even though people are deceived and didn't really get it and kind of uh, think that it's all been fulfilled. It's for a time yet to come. Reveals very much the same thing and more details to John. It says, don't seal it up because the time is near, which begs the question, I think it's been a while. So how can it be the time is near? That takes us to Acts chapter 2. We're almost done. Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit is poured out on the church and uh, everybody's speaking in tongues, unknown languages. The crowd says, says, I think they're drunk. And Peter stands up and says, uh, we're not drunk. It's not even nine in the morning. It's a Jewish feast day. We haven't drunk anything yet. We're fasting until a certain time. So we can't be drunk. And then he says, What's happening was actually spoken of by the prophet Joel. And then you're kind of familiar with that. The first opening, Peter says, in the last day, God says, I'll pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream uh, dreams. And, uh, and we see a lot of that in the book of Acts. What uh, he goes on, continues the prophecy of Joel. And as you know, then begins to talk about events that take place during the great tribulation. The sun blackened, the moon turning to blood, and all these kinds of things. Anybody notice any of those things happening yet? No, I haven't noticed that. But we know from John they will happen during the Great Tribulation period. So what's, what's Peter saying? At this point, he says, in the last days, God says. Why is this happening? We're in the last days, Peter says. <laughs> John says, the angel tells him, don't seal up the scroll because the time's at hand. Peter stands up and says, this is it. This is the beginning. We've been in the last days ever since the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church. And that's going to continue. And, uh, and we don't go into the tribulation until the Antichrist is revealed. Now, again, what we just read, Paul says there's a restraining force that keeps the Antichrist from being revealed. What is he? Who is that restraining force? Well, the Holy Spirit in the life of the church kicked it off. It's the Holy Spirit in the life of the church that's removed that reveals the Antichrist. We call that the rapture. When the church is raptured to be with the Lord, again, Paul says in, uh, to the church in Thessalonica that the Lord himself will come down from heaven <clears throat> with a loud command, with the uh, voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and we who uh, um, and the dead in Christ will rise first. We who are still alive and left will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we'll be, we'll be with the Lord forever. The rapture of the church, that's the restraining force that allows the Antichrist to come upon the scene. Again, it's important for us to see this because there's about, the Jews today don't really understand it. They think it's all been fulfilled. They're, they're ready to be deceived by, the, by a fake Messiah that will come to the Middle East, and a lot of the church has been deceived because they think all these things have already been fulfilled as well. So again, next week, Antiochus Epiphany, more details about him, verification of Daniel and his prophecy, 
But the next week, those details pertain to a time yet future, the Antichrist that will come on the scene. What it means is we can learn all about him, know what he looks like, know what's going to happen, but we'll never see him because the church will be gone before the Antichrist comes on the scene. Uh, what I hope it means to us is, is this. <clears throat> It'd be like if, uh, I don't know if you read about that uh, luxury liner that hit an iceberg and was going down <laughs> this last week. Everybody quickly got into the lifeboats. There was a Norwegian luxury liner nearby, came by, picked them up. Every, everybody was fine. Uh, it wouldn't be real encouraging to you if the captain came by and said, we just hit an iceberg, we want to get into the lifeboats quickly. By the way, did I mention that the lifeboats have several holes in them? That, that wouldn't exactly be, be good news to you at that time. Uh, and yet at the same time, uh, if people don't really believe that their Bibles are true, uh, they've got a lifeboat in a time of desperation that's got holes in it. What are you really going to cling to? What are you going to hold on? What are you really going to trust? What I want to say is that when we study prophecy in these kinds of details, and what we know from the Dead Sea Scrolls is that we've got a lifeboat that is secure and will, will hold us and will never allow us to go down. It's the Word of God. And, and I can tell you from being with people that are going through death experiences and think they're dying, uh, a lot of the dear saints in the Lord, they'll, they'll just tell me, especially the older ones, uh, Pastor, don't talk to me. Just read me the scriptures. <laughs> That's what I need to hear right now. Uh, because they believe the word of God. And if we believe it, that it is inspired, then we can say, and it is useful for teaching, for, for rebuking. Ooh, they want to hear that part. Correcting and training in righteousness in some aspects of our lives. No, in every aspect of our life. So that we'll be thoroughly equipped for everything the Lord wants us to do. Everything. Not just coming to church on Sunday. No, everything. How you handle your finances. Yeah, everything. How you raise your kids. Everything. How you view art and history. And, yeah, everything. And really that launches us into, that's my segue into the, the truth project. <laughs> that, that's what that does. And Paul says, do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed from it by the renewing of your mind. And we get that from the word of God. He says, in that way, we'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. It's good and pleasing and perfect will. And sometimes there's Christians out there that struggle with the basic issue of what is God's will for my life. It comes back to the word of God. Uh, we can trust it. It can conform, uh, again, transform our minds. And, uh, and then we'll know what God's good and pleasing and perfect will is. Don't get lost in the details. It's good to see them, but we want to see the big picture at the same time. Amen. Lord, we do thank you that, um, that we've got the details of, of Daniel, uh, that they are so specific, God, and uh, uh, there's certainly no reason for us to question uh, the uh, authenticity of your word uh, and how it can minister to our hearts. I pray that we would uh, learn to love it and to trust it and uh, Lord, just go to it daily, that it might be uh, the nourishment to our souls that, that we need. Lord, we pray that um, you'd give us an, an excitement just to have a Bible, just to study uh, your word. Again, having just come back from China and see the tremendous hunger people have who don't have a Bible, who would walk a long ways and give a lot just to have a copy of the scriptures, Lord. God, may we have that same kind of hunger and, uh, and just an awe in, in, of your inspired word as we, as we leave this morning. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.